to speak here and thanks all of you for, for tuning in. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about uh, categorical causal duality and I'm going to explain what that means and uh, how we prove it. Um, and so uh, let me give you a very brief outline first. Uh, I should say this is my first Zoom seminar, so uh, do not hesitate to interrupt if things aren't working out or just if you have a question about the map as you would normally. Um, so the starting point uh, for this, seeing how this is a topology seminar, um, really is uh, Adam Scobar construction, which is the algebraic version of the loop space in topology. Um, and um, if one considers this Scobar construction, which naturally goes from co-algebras to algebras, um, it comes uh, with an adjoint, and in modern language, it gives rise to duality, um, which can be interpreted as causal duality between suitable DG algebras and co algebras. Um, and being very careful, they're actually curved co algebras, curved co networking co algebras. Uh, and I'm going to explain what that means because not everybody might be familiar with that. Um, and then um, I'm going to talk about extending this to a causal duality. Uh, which has DG categories rather than DG algebras on, on one side. Um, and then the dual notion um, is still a co-algebra. Um, it's something called a point curved, pointed curved co-algebra. Um, and again, I'm going to say what that means, but so this is a very natural generalization of this causal duality. Um, and it's, um, it turns out to be very closely related uh, to the peer and nerve construction uh, from the theory of infinity categories. So there's many different models of infinity categories, um, many of them equivalent to each other, um, I mean, all of them equivalent to each other, all the good ones at least. Um, and the coherent nerve is a very natural way of going from simplicial categories to quasi categories, simplicial sets seen as infinity categories. Um, and if one looks at this, then Somehow what we're doing is a linearization of this coherent nerve. Um, but of course it has uh, independent interest. Um, I'm going to talk about an application at the very end. Um, right, so all of this is, is joined with Andrew Lazarev and it's uh, available on the archive since June. So let me uh, get started uh, properly. I'm sorry, so work. Um, I'm oh, yeah. sorry Julian, this this connection between the Kovar construction and the homotopy coherent nerve. Mm -hmm. um, do you know when this was first discussed, first discovered? Um, between the Kovar construction and the coherent nerve, I don't, I mean, in, in this generality, it's, it's new, um, but that there's some relation um, is, is older. I don't actually know um, where precisely to give, to give credit there. So I think this was the main um, um, content of the work that I did with Manuel. In the and one object case. Yeah. Right. The one object case. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's certainly, I mean, I'm certainly going um, gonna to mention that, that somehow this is, um, uh, yeah, so the, as, as Manuel was saying, in the one object case, this is exactly, uh, exactly your work. Um, but somehow the, the point very much is here to, to go to the multi-object case and to understand DG categories. Yeah, so because the reason I asked is because I maybe you were not aware of the, uh, the work that you have done, but I don't see that it anywhere referenced in your, your um, publications. Ah, um, we have, have we not updated the, um, the archives? Do we have, uh, I mean, we certainly, uh, we've talked about this with Manuel, we certainly, edited the manuscript. It's possible we haven't yet uploaded it on the archive. Um, yeah, okay. Which is, uh, yeah, which is an oversight. I'm sorry about that. Okay, no problem. But it's certainly uh, something we, uh, we intend to do. Okay. Um, okay, let me, get, um, let me get on with it then. Um, we are going to talk about, um, so our setting, we're going to work over a field K, but most statements um, also work uh, over the integers. Um, some are a little bit less ele elegant, um, some are no longer quite true, and so uh, let's just work over a field for simplicity. And um, this is what we call the loop space, which of course everybody here uh, knows, so photologic space with a base point. Uh, we can talk about the space loop space. Um, and then we can ask, um, 
can we describe the natural DG algebra of chains of the loop space, which is an algebra because we can concatenate loops algebraically if we start with the algebraic version of X, say singular chains on X, um, singular chains on X naturally being a co-algebra. Um, and the answer to this question is, uh, is yes, due to Adams uh, in uh, 56. I should first say we always consider normalized singular chains to, um, for things to work out. Um, right, so we can do this. Um, and so the first observation um, that this works and the construction of the COBA uh, complex is, is due to Adams in 56, only in the simply connected case. Um, and then, of course, uh, Manu and uh, Ramadzinali in 2018 proved the general case. Um, and then uh, Anil Adams and myself uh, gave a separate proof a year later. Um, and um, right, so that's somehow where the, um, the Cobar uh, construction comes from, if you will. Um, so chains in the loop space is really just the Cobar construction of the co-algebra of chains. Um, so let's recall this uh, Cobar construction. Uh, we're going to work with the collapotent DG co-algebra. So C is a co-algebra with a um, delta denoting the co-product. There's a differential. There's a co-unit. We can look at the um, kernel of the co-unit. And then we have the reduced Cobar construction, which is an augmented DG algebra. So we take the free graded algebra on C bar. Um, let me, uh, right, so we have our down field K, we have C bar, we have C bar times the C bar, um, et cetera. Um, and that forms the complex with the differential which is induced um, by the differential of C and the co-multiplication of C. Um, so this is just a free graded algebra on C bar shifted in degree. Um, and then that has it's, it's an algebra because it's free, free algebra. Um, it has an augmentation. Um, and we can do the same thing dually um, and do the reduced bar construction um, for DG algebra. So now we start with an augmented DG algebra A. Um, so we have A bar, um, which I haven't defined here, A bar is going to be, um, if you will, the kernel of the augmentation of A. And then we perform this bar construction um, where we take the tensor co-algebra on A bar shifted. And we um, and that is a um, it's a free conal potent coalgebra. Um, so it's not a free coalgebra. Free coalgebras are kind of strange uh, objects or difficult to define. But it's a, it's as a conal potent coalgebra. It is free, um, and it has a um, multiplication. It has a, a differential again induced by differ uh, by the differential and the multiplication. Um, and so this is a um, a classical story. Julian, can um, I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So are you assuming any um, conditions on the grading or you're just assuming Z-graded co-algebras and Z-graded? Ah, um, yes, yeah, so it's Z-graded. Okay, so, okay. so the Cobar construction uh, can be negatively graded as well. And, okay. uh, and have, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, right, I mean, it's, it's not... Um, yeah, but because of the shifts, one can even, it's, it's not even very easy to, to do things in a, to restrict to non negatively, non positively graded because something might be shifted right. out of that. Yeah. Um, so, this is sort of the classical uh, story. And then, um, right, so this is just a comment again that we have the, the tensor co algebra um, is co free as a co co algebra. And uh, maybe you said this, but just just uh, again, um, mm -hmm. by conal potent, you mean that um, iterated applications of the co-product on C bar will eventually vanish? Yes. Okay. Um, so will event if I um, so I have to be a bit careful. And um, once I quotient out by uh, 
write it at the kernel of the code you wrote, then mm -hmm. iterate it, compile yeah, yeah, that, that's um, that's yeah. will, will kill things. Yes. Um, uh, okay, so let me talk about curvature. Um, because as defined, the bar construction started with taking an augmented algebra. Um, and we use this uh, augmentation to write down this reduced bar construction. Um, and so we had to split the unit map. And if I have a general DG algebra without an augmentation, um, we don't have a splitting as algebras, but we can still choose a splitting of vector spaces. Um, so we, have, we still have some kind of decomposition where A is A bar plus K, and we can do our augmented bar construction. Um, but if we do that, um, and we just follow through the construction, then this differential which we've defined, or which I've said you can define, um, is no longer squares to zero. It's no longer actually a differential. Um, so um, we just follow through and we end up with a curvature term on the bar construction of A. Um, and so uh, I'm going to write down the curvature term, um, but I'm going to make my life a little bit easier. Um, so co-algebras are confusing. When I started working with co-algebras, I thought they were very confusing. And then after a while, I decided actually they're, they're fine. You just dualize everything and it's good. And then working more with them and trying to do computations, I'm now back to the position that co-algebras are confusing. Um, and one trick of working with co-algebras is to dualize and instead work with algebras, which of course um, is not in general, um, does not in general tell you everything you need to know because algebras and co-algebras are not perfectly dual. Um, but the only obstacle to that is that the dual of a co-algebra really has a topology because a co-algebra is a limit, is a co-limit of its finite dimensional sub co -algebras, the fundamental theme of co-algebras. And so the dual of a co-algebra will be a limit of its finite dimensional quotients. Um, and so that gives a topology just as the, the limit topology of these discrete quotients. Um, and an algebra with such a topology is called a pseudo-compact algebra. Um, and if I take the continuous dual of a pseudo-compact algebra, I get back a co-algebra. And so I can change between algebras and co-algebras, and all my formulas go back and forth between algebras and co-algebras. Um, and I don't have to worry uh, too much about the distinction if I'm willing to carry along the topology. Um, and so uh, my main reason for mentioning that is that so I can write down the curvature term um, in this convenient way, the curvature term. So that's a degree two element H um, of my, in this case, um, the pseudo compact algebra is the dual of the bar construction of the algebra A. Um, and the square of the differential D squared acts as the bracket with H. And if I, uh, right, I could also write this down in terms of co-algebras, uh, but then it's just a little bit um, messier, uh, in particular with the signs. Uh, By bracket, you mean commutator? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is just an, an honest commutator, right? Because it's an algebra, um, it is an honest commutator, HA plus minus AH, um, and plus minus following just the, the sign, the user sign convention, minus one to the uh, degree of H, which is, Two, so it's always uh, actually yeah, um, just the minus sign. Uh, okay, so um, we naturally get curvature, even if we just start with this bar cobar construction, just try and get rid of this uh, restrictive assumption of having an augmentation. Um, and then, uh, we can formulate cone of potent causal duality in a very general way. Um, so we're going to sum up some results about curved causal duality, uh, which is shown um, in generality by Kozitelsky, um, but there's work um, in that vein going back also to, uh, to the group of uh, Bernard Keller. Um, but there's a number of really nice uh, results. So there's an adjunction um, bar cobar between curved conopotent co-algebras and DG algebras. Um, and we can put model structures on the two sides and we get a clone equivalence of models categories. And the weak equivalences in DG algebra are just the usual quasi-isomorphisms. So this is the usual 
model structure of the G algebras. Um, and the weak equivalences in curved causal potent co-algebras are a bit more subtle. So we could define them just by saying they are whatever the COBA construction sends to quasi isomorphism, uh, which is a perfectly good definition. Um, but there's also an intrinsic definition as filtered quasi isomorphism. Uh, right, so it's maybe worth mentioning that, of course, I can't define quasi isomorphisms of curved objects because D doesn't square to zero, so there's no cohomology. Um, but a co algebra comes with an, uh, a conopotent co algebra comes with admissible filtration that has an associated graded, which turns out to be differential, uh, to be differential graded. Um, and then I get a graded map, which I can check if it's a filtered quasi isomorphism, and those are the weak equivalences. Um, so there's a nice, um, a nice, a nice, there are nice model categories. Um, and we can also compare um, the modules. So for NTG algebra A, I have an equivalence between the A modules and the co modules over the bar construction on A. Um, and similarly, if I start with a curved Kronoproton co algebra, I have an equivalence between its co modules and the modules over its bar construction. Um, and here again, it's, a, it's an equivalence of, of model categories. Um, and here again, the notion of quasi isomorphism um, is um, a little bit subtle. Um, and in particular, for the A modules and the omega C modules, I just have quasi isomorphisms as weak equivalences. Um, but on the left hand side, for co modules, I should uh, take so called, um, uh, essentially, I take Weak, as weak equivalences maps which have a co acyclic cone rather than an acyclic cone, which is just a weakening. Um, it's, um, I'm not going to say precisely what it is. Um, it is weaker than being quasi isomorphic, it is stronger than being homotopy equivalent. Um, but uh, stronger than being quasi isomorphic, stronger than being quasi isomorphic, weaker than being homotopy equivalent. Being co acyclic is um, stronger than being acyclic and weaker than being homotopy equivalent to zero. Um, anyway, so this is just some of the results we have um, in, the, in this case, which is exactly the results that we would like to, uh, to generalize. Uh, Julian, how, so does, how does filtered quasi-isomorphism compare to quasi-isomorphism after applying COBAR? Uh, they are equivalent. In, so in, in, the just, in the homotopy category, they are equivalent. Yeah. Right, but not, not before passing to the homotopy category, I believe. Ah, um, I mean, like a map between two DG co-algebras, uh, asking that map to be a quasi-isomorphism after applying COBAR is not equivalent to asking it to be a filtered quasi-isomorphism. Like if you have uh, one, then you'll get yeah. a zigzag. Ah, uh, yes, it, it's, yes, it, it's zigzag, it's true. So um, filtered quasi-isomorphisms, um, Right, so I should, I should have been more precise here. Um, Filtered quasi isomorphisms don't actually satisfy two out of three, so I have to take zigzags of Filtered quasi isomorphisms. Um, and then those will map to weak equivalences. I think that is right. Um, let's just write zigzags here to um, be on the same side, and then we should, we should really have uh, the same notion. Um, but thanks, yeah, that's a, a rather not, a, not quite accurate. Uh, let me um, give to uh, a little bit excursion about curvature, um, just uh, to uh, two facts which may help um, to avoid confusion about curvatures. Um, so the curvature is in a way the square of the differential, but that doesn't mean that if the differential squares to zero, I could still have a curved algebra, a curved co-algebra. Um, my curvature could be zero, but I still have, um, so my curvature could be zero, or my curvature might, for example, just be uh, central, if I remember my uh, formula from, uh, from a while ago, um, right, d squared of a was a commutator of h and a, and so if h is central, then d squared will be zero, but I still have a non-trivial curvature. Um, and even if I have a zero curvature, it is still different to look at an object as a curved object or as a not curved object because there's different morphisms. So there's more morphisms between two curved co-algebras 
um, even if the curvature happens to be zero, um, and morphisms need not preserve curvature. So the, uh, the key example is always if I have um, an algebra, say, A, D with curvature zero, and I just twist the curvature by adding some term A, where A is just a degree one element, um, then I get a different curvature, a different algebra, which has uh, differential D plus A, and now it's curvature DA plus A squared. Um, but they're isomorphic as curved algebras. Um, not just weakly equivalent, but actually isomorphic. Um, and I mean, the good news is that these kind from a twist of the differential and honest maps are the, the maps between curved co-algebras that we need to look at. Um, and it's really parallel with, the, uh, with augmented algebras. If I have maps between augmented algebras, um, I could have maps which don't preserve the augmentation. And that exactly corresponds to maps between curvature zero algebras um, that are not maps of the underlying DG algebra, DG algebras. Um, and one more useful uh, fact about co-algebras, this is straightforward, but it uh, seems to be little known, um, is that there is, um, there's obviously an, an embedding of uh, DG algebras, say, into curved DG algebras, by just adding a curvature equal zero, and this has an adjoint. Uh, so there's an uncurving factor left adjoint to the inclusion from DG algebras to curved algebras. Um, and dually, if I include DG co-algebras into curved DG co-algebras, then there's a right adjoint. Um, and uh, it's not even very hard to, uh, to write down. I just add a free generator and twist the differential to remove the curvature. Um, okay, so now let's talk about differential graded categories. So if we want to extend the story beyond DG algebras, uh, what we need to do is we need to find a bar construction of a small DG category. Um, and I mean, all my DG categories are going to be small, otherwise um, I, I don't really have much, much hope of associating a co-algebra to it. Um, because if you're interested in, in large DG categories, you just have to um, come up with, with another universe to make things work. Um, and the best way to do that is to rewrite uh, what a category is. Um, so how does that work? Um, I'm going to redefine a category. A small k-linear category C consists of the following data, a set of objects S, and a monoid in KS by modules. Uh, okay, so what is KS? Well, if I have a set S, I can define a co-algebra on the vector space with basis S, where just each S is group-like. So that means this condition co-product of S is S tensor S, and then I extend linearly. Um, and what's the K as, uh, okay, as by co-modules, they have a co-tensor product, defined as the equalizer of the left and right co-actions. Um, so much like we have a, uh, we usually have a, uh, the tensor product defined but if I, I don't know if I want to define M tensor over R, where then um, I take M tensor N and I have a left and a right action and I form the equalizer. Similarly, I can take M tensor N if they are uh, by co-modules and then I have a left co-action and a right co-action. And here my co-algebra is just this KS. And then I have an equalizer, and this is the cotensor product. Um, and this cotensor product makes my bi co modules into a monoidal category. And I can talk about monoids in there. Um, so this is somewhat just the, the basic definitions of, of co modules. Um, and the, the beautiful thing that happens is that this exactly. Um, gives us a model for, for categories. So how does this happen? Um, so if I have an element S in my set S, which I should think of as an object of the category, then I have an inclusion of sets, and that gives me an inclusion of co-algebras from the co-algebra K to this KS. Um, and this is a structure of a KS co-module on K, 
we will denote it by ks. Um, so what does this mean? It just means uh, right at co a ks co module means ks has to map to ks tensor k capital S. Um, and of course, this is a k which is the tensor unit. And so this map is my inclusion. And that gives me a structure of, uh, of co-module on K. Uh, and this is gonna to correspond to the object S um, and to the identity morphism on S. Um, so now if I have two objects, S1 and S2, I want to define the home set between them and I'm just going to take the cotensor product of KS1 over KS with V over KS with KS2. Um, this is my definition. And then the composition is going to be determined by the monoid structure. Um, and, um, right, and the composition, of course, only exists if S2 Right, if I have two copies of S2 here, rather than having uh, a right, S2 here, um, rather than having different objects. And that corresponds exactly um, to the fact that an, only a monoid in, uh, for this cotensor product, right? So I don't have a product, um, if I go back here, but I don't have a product defined um, from M tensor N, from V tensor V to V, I only have it partially defined from V tensor KS to V. Um, so let's go backwards um, to uh, make this maybe clearer. Um, so if I have a small K linear category C and a set of objects, I just define V to be the direct sum of all the home sets between all the objects. And then the claim is that this is going to be a uh, monoid in bico modules. Um, so the space V has a natural structure um, of the KS bico module just by um, using the um, source and target of the morphism. So I have to define a map which goes from V to KS tensor V, V tensor KS. Um, and I use this inclusion map um, coming from the KS1 and the KS2 to think of as the uh, identity map on the object S1 and the object S2. And then the composition in C gives me a monoid map. Um, uh, right before going here, right, maybe I should spell it out. So I have V tensor V, and of course I can't compose all the morphisms, so I don't have a map like this but I do have a map if I replace this here with the cotensor product. Um, and so I've described all of this for k-linear categories for simplicity, but of course the same works if I have differential graded categories instead of linear categories. Um, and in, I mean, I've just somehow unraveled some definitions, but it turns out that this is um, really a rather nice way to look at a category in our context. Um, so this object is uh, that I've found where it has a shape of a co-algebra and a monoid in bico modules. And this is what is sometimes called a semi-algebra, this pair V comma R. Uh, okay, are there questions up to so, here? So in this semi-algebra, uh, R is K of S in the previous example, is that right? Um, yes, so here R is exactly K S. Okay, so so in particular, I guess any semi-algebra gives rise to a linear category. Is that correct? Because you can take group-like elements in R, and this will be your set of objects. Right. So I mean, if I mean, if my co-algebra R is, is more complicated than of being of this form K S, um, then um, I guess I throw out some information if I do that. Right. So you could. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in fact, it's not clear that my co-action is going to land in the sub co-algebra of group like oh, elements. That's true. I see. So um, yeah. So okay. so in order to in general, get, it's a in order to yeah. get a category, you need R to be uh, 
like the um the the group yes, yes. Uh, yeah like the free thing this on particular the form of of core algebra yeah um right but whenever i have a semi-algebra i can um try and perform a bar construction Um, so we define a bar construction with semi-algebra just like we define the usual bar construction and it's again going to be a reduced bar construction. Um, so if we have a small DG category D, we consider it as a semi-algebra V comma R. So V is the direct sum of the home spaces. R is the co-algebra on the elements of D, on the objects of D. We choose some decomposition. Um, V is R plus V bar as R by co-modules. Uh, this composition is not going to be compatible with the composition, so with the product structure. Um, it can't be unless there's only one object. Uh, well, it can't be unless the category is very special um, because what can always happen in my category that I have some um, identity on some object in D and I factor this as a product of two maps um, which go between different objects. And now I cannot have a map from V, the direct sum of the homes, down to R, the direct sum of the identities, which is compatible with composition, because I would have to send these to zero, but their product has to go to the identity if I have any kind of augmentation in the sense. I really can't have an augmentation. So I must end up in some curved setting. Um, so there is a curved co-algebra. Can I make a comment, Julian? Yes. Uh, which is something funny that I actually, I kind, of, I kind of learned reading your paper, which I wasn't aware of. So maybe this is a good point to share it, which is you can make sense of uh, categories and co-categories, right? Cate linear categories and linear co-categories. And you have a cobar functor from co-categories to categories, but then you don't have a, a like a well-defined functor from um, category, from, sorry, from categories to co-categories. You know, the bar construction. Okay. I never thought about this in terms of co-categories. Yeah, That's the bar construction is not quite well-defined and you kind of land in this, in this setting you're describing. Anyway, if you haven't thought well, about- I mean, the setting that is being described can be uh, called curved core categories, and then you do have a core bar functor landing exactly. into core categories, but curved core categories. Exactly. And if you want to land mm -hmm. in uh, normal core categories, then you should have an augmented category, namely you should not have any invertibles, which is sometimes the case, case but very rarely. Exactly, exactly. Oh, yes, yeah, that's a good point. Learn this. Uh, right. This. <laughs> yeah. Okay, exactly the curvature point again. Um, okay, so um, we have um, this curved co algebra construction where we take the, um, right, we take the free conal potent co algebra here, um, the free conal potent R co algebra, I guess. We equip it with a differential coming from the multiplication and a curvature um, also coming from the multiplication and the differential. Um, so we have a tensor co-algebra on V bar over R, over the co-algebra uh, R. So this happens in bi core modules, equipped with differential and curvature. And they both come from the differential and the composition of D. Um, and the reason why they essentially why they give rise to both the differential and the curvature is that I can somehow decompose my differential and composition in terms of what they do on R and, and what they do on V bar. Um, and though this is a curved co-algebra, which of course needs to be checked. Um, and there are signs to make everything work in front of this N1, M2, H1, H2. Uh, these signs are evil, um, but we fought them and we won. Um, and everything works out. Um, and of course, everything needs to work out, um, but it is really kind of um, non-trivial to, to check that everything um, does what it should do. Um, yeah, and this is where I decided that, that trying to understand things in terms of co-algebras is not actually the way forward and dualizing uh, 
well, Andre pointed out to me, I think, that dualizing makes your life much better here. And uh, the obvious question, comment, uh, that in the case of a one object category, this will reproduce the ordinary cobar? Uh, yes. So in the case of a one object category, uh, would we can look at that as a DG algebra, and that gives us back the usual cobar construction, exactly. Um, right. So here, our core algebra. Um, means common and R by common is R. That doesn't quite make sense. Um, what I mean to say is that, right, the, instead of tensor core algebra here, I could have said free kernel potent uh, R core algebra. That's just some of what this tensor core algebra uh, construction does. Um, and now it's, it's worth noticing that what we get, so it's a co algebra, it's an R co algebra, so that is a co algebra with a sub co algebra R. That somehow, if I have a co algebra with a sub co algebra, it's automatically a co monoid, a monoid in by co modules. Um, so somehow what I end up with is, is a much simpler construction, it's just a relative co algebra, and moreover, R by construction is the co radical of this co-algebra B, D. So it is somehow um, the, 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 the non conal potent part of this co-algebra. Um, so I really just get like a curve co-algebra um, and I don't have extra data and structure to keep track of. Um, I just need to understand which co-algebras I get in this way because they're clearly somehow special. Sorry, Julian, how do you define the core radical of a co-algebra? Um, so the core radical is, um, I, uh, okay. I mean, so, but the idea is if I quotient out by the co-radical, then the rest is not this kernel potent. So take the maximal co-algebra such that, uh, minimal co-algebra, but if I quotient it out, then the co-multiplication is strictly no potent. Um, but so, I mean, the, the whole point here is that I can recover this, if I have BD, if you just give me BD as a co-algebra, I can recover R. Um, and so what is this? It's a pointed curve co-algebra. Um, okay, what does pointed mean? Um, so pointed means that the co-radical is a direct sum of copies of K, which is exactly the form we have here, coming from the objects of the category. Um, and then I want the inclusion of the co-radical to have a splitting, and the inclusion and the splitting should both be compatible with the differentials. Um, and this is genuinely um, a, a condition which isn't always satisfied in the wild. If I have a pointed co-algebra, which is also DG or also curve, um, there's not necessarily any reason to assume that those structures will be compatible. So you have to enforce that. Um, and then the Kovar construction of a pointed curve co-algebra is exactly what we would expect. We take the free algebra over C naught on C bar. Um, ah, there's a, there's a shift here, of course. Um, and we define a differential. Um, and the differential has parts which come from the coproduct. This one comes from the coproduct, comes from the differential, and comes from the curvature of C. Um, so, so now this free. This free algebra is using the cotensor product. Is that right? Uh, yes, um, exactly. So I, I take the um, some. It's a, it's like a free monoid in the category of bico modules with the cotensor product. Um, yeah. So this is C naught and um, C bar and C bar. C bar and so on. Um, and again, uh, we have to get the signs right, um, but again, this works. Uh, I'll postpone the aside for a moment. Um, and then we have to uh, do the usual thing and show that we have an adjunction between bar and cobar, but literally the same proof that works classically works here as well. Um, so one can identify uh, somehow the um, if I have 
comes in EG categories uh, from the Cobar construction on C to some EG category D. Um, I can identify that with some kind of Maracaton elements, some kind of twisting co-chains in the HOM set from C to D. Um, and I can identify that with the HOMs in uh, uh, the other way in pointed uh, co-algebras from C to the bar construction on D. J Julian, can you explain for a second how do you make um... I, this is probably straightforward, but I don't see it. How do you make C into a or C bar into a C zero co-module? You use the um, thing, right? So, so the co-module structure means that I need a map from C to C tensor C bar to C zero, right? Um, and I can just do that by taking my product and composing with a splitting. Um, right, so I have the, I have a map from C to C zero, um, so I don't know call this bit in S, and then here this is and it, it's okay that the splitting might not be a graded map or sorry um. Is the splitting a graded map? Uh, I'm not getting the sound. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, now I can hear you, yes. Yeah, I was asking, um, the splitting is probably not a graded map if C is graded, but um, that, that's fine. Right, the splitting, um, I mean, the examples we care about the splitting will be graded. But, um, but how come if you have, for example, um, Maybe you'll talk about this later, but if C is chains on a simplex, mm -hmm. isn't this splitting like taking a simplex and sending it to one of the vertices? Um, right. I mean, the splitting is um, something. Uh, right. No. So it, it's sending a simplex to zero, unless it's a zero simplex. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it, it really just kills everything which isn't in degree zero. Um, Okay, so let me, uh, let me make this aside um, just very briefly, which is more of a, um, it's not the most important point, but curved coordinate was as defined, not have a terminal object. Um, so we just throw in an, an artificial terminal object. Um, the reason I don't have a terminal object is exactly that these, uh, like we have these extra maps corresponding to twisting, twisting, the, um, twisting the curvature, twisting the differential. Um, and um, we can throw in this extra final element um, and we can, uh, define the Cobar construction just to be the DG category, which has one object and only the zero morphism, which was a problem for our construction on DG categories earlier because we wouldn't have a splitting for that one. So we, we take these two misfits and match them up, and then we do have a very nice adjunction. Um, and we do have all the results we would hope for. So there is an adjunction, the Cobar bar adjunction between pointed curved co algebras with a final object. And DG categories. We have to twist the notion of DG category a little bit, but it is equivalent to the usual one. We just have to throw out some DG categories which are not interesting um, and equivalent to the DG categories which we keep. Um, so this adjunction gives them equivalent equivalence of suitable model categories, uh, where we have the usual Dwyer Kahn model structure on DG categories. Um, and we define a model category structure on curved co algebras. A pointed curve co algebras, which we essentially transfer. I mean, in particular, we don't have a particularly nice description of the weak equivalences. Uh, let me stay here for a second. In pointed curve co algebras. So these weak equivalences, they can't be filled quasi isomorphisms. We can generalize the notion of filled quasi isomorphism, but that would keep the number of objects fixed, and that's clearly not something that we want. Um, so with this model category of structures, maybe not yet completely understood, but it, but it exists and it gives an equivalence. And we also have the equivalences for co-modules and modules that we would expect. So if I want to understand um, modules for DG category, I just find this to be G vector spaces. Um, I can look at that as co-modules over the bar construction. Uh, so this is our main theorem, mechanical and duality. 
Um, and how do you talk about Julian, this? One, yeah. Julian, one comment about the uh, language. So pointed means it has a lot of points. It doesn't mean you choose a point. It's like the way it's usually the word is used in algebra. So yes, um, yes. That's pointed a, that's means it has a lot of points. Yeah. Yes, and it somehow it has um, it has genuine points somehow. It has genuine uh, points. Yeah. These um, also really wide known under the name proof core category. Uh, Right, so I mean, yeah, I, I'm not somehow the, the biggest fan of the name pointed co-algebra, but it seems to... Uh, how um, about pointy? Pointy <laughs> co-algebra. <laughs> Why don't you just co uh, call them curved co-categories? Yeah, yeah, I think it's Is the it same. for that name? Um, yeah, that may be a better name, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced by the, by the co-category point of view, but I mean, in a way, that this talk is arguing that they should be considered as co-categories because they are clearly the... Um, the causal dual of categories. Um, but I mean, they're honest categories, they're honest co-algebras, right? It's just a particular kind of co-algebra. But like if you take the notion of category and try to add curvature to that, just like along the Posetselsky line, then you precisely get what you call those pointed co-algebras. Uh, right. Written down in probably in some of the archive of Orsted works. Okay, never mind. I'll write to you after your talk. Jim okay, we can, we can talk about the, the naming conventions more. Jim Stashev is suggesting the name point, pointified in the chat. <laughs> pointified. <laughs> pointified. Also a good one. Um, yes, let's, uh, let, let's settle the naming question after this talk. We, we should um, come up with something. Um, okay, um, and now let's talk about this, um, the relation to quasi-categories. Um, which, uh, and so the, the motivating example um, in a way for pointed curve co-algebras are the chain co-algebras of simplicial sets used as a model for infinity categories. Um, and so this is not somehow often a way in which one thinks about infinity categories, but as a quasi-category, um, that's a simplicial set. And if I have a simplicial set, I can take the chain co-algebra of that. And I consider that as an algebraic object. Um, and it fits very nicely into this, uh, into this story except for one detail that they're not actually pointed. Um, and the problem is that the natural projection map, uh, which we use, which throws out all the higher simplices, is not compatible with the differential, right? So if I have some, uh, some one simplex here, um, and then I send that to Q minus Q, and then the augmentation map sends that, uh, the co-augmentation map sends uh, the splitting, sends that to Q minus Q, and of course this goes to zero, goes to zero, so this does not commute at all. Um, but this is somehow where curvature comes in to save us, even though this is, this co-algebra of course has curvature equal to zero, the differential squares to zero. Um, we can look at it as a curved co-algebra and look at an isomorphic model of a curved co-algebra. Um, and so the, which I'm gonna call the twisted chain co-algebra, where essentially what we do is we just twist away those boundary terms of the differential, uh, which, were, which were bothering us. Um, and so as curved co-algebras, these two are isomorphic, even though they're both, the differential squares to zero, they're perfectly good co-algebras, not isomorphic as co-algebras, as DG co-algebras, but as curved, co as curved co-algebras, they are. Um, and so this is uh, the object we can work with. Um, so roughly we remove the boundary terms from the differential um, and it's a little bit more subtle as we consider normalized chains um, as was pointed out to us by, by Manuel. So that's another thing in the, uh, in the archive paper which we should clarify a little bit. Um, and now let's make this to the query enough. And I mean, as uh, Robert said, this is um, indeed in the one object case, this uh, was uh, worked out by, uh, by you two. Um, and then in the, in the multi-object case, um, uh, this fits into, into our story here. So um, let me recall again, there's a lot of models of infinity one categories. Um, two of the most important ones are simplicial categories, which are in a way um, almost a naive model. We just enrich our category over spaces because we know that spaces are supposed to be infinity zero categories. Um, and then the quasi-categories introduced by Jorial and then extended by, by Jacob Lurie 
um, so much extended that now they're often just called infinity cap groups. But at, you know, at the bottom, there's simply a structure on some visual sets. Um, the fiber and subgroup sets in a certain model structure. And now um, the connection between them is the coherent nerve functor, just generalizing the, the usual nerve. So inside here live categories. Um, this is equal to some visual sets, and I have the usual nerve functor here. And then I can extend that to some visual categories in a way which I'm not going to explain, but which takes care of the coherent uh, composition structures. Um, and then we can build, uh, well, we can linearize this, right? So there's a dot Kahn correspondence, which I can compose with linearizing to go from simplicial categories to DG categories. And there is the Chenko algebra functor, which I can twist and then send my quasi categories to pointed curved co-algebras. Um, and this is a, this is a left grown functor between model categories. It, um, preserves weak equivalences, so it's like a well-behaved, uh, nice functor. Um, and so now I can assemble a commuted diagram, and it does indeed commute, at least in the homotopy category. So I have quasi-categories um, at the top left. I have a canonical functor to superficial categories left adjoint to the coherent nerve. Um, then I have my two linearization functors. And then at the bottom, I have the cobar bar duality. Um, and up to homotopy equivalence, this does indeed uh, commute. Um, and uh, yeah, and th th this it works, uh, still works if I'm working uh, over the integers. Um, over the integers, we don't actually have the model structures um, in the bottom row, but we can look at everything as relative categories. So just uh, a notion of infinity category, we just specify our weak equivalences. Um, and then this diagram of relative categories commutes up to homotopy. Uh, so Julian, I I, yeah. I I really think that this generalization to many object case is a useful and important generalization. Um, so, uh, but but I appreciate if you could correct that in the papers that yes, one, sorry, one no, we uh, case, yeah, we should have done that uh, yeah more quickly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right, so the DG nerve, um, right, uh, so the DG nerve um, is another way of, uh, of getting some mileage out of this construction. Um, so that's a construction uh, of going directly from a DG category to an infinity category. Um, and in this, in this diagram here, it essentially corresponds to going, uh, to going this way. Um, of course, if I start with the DG category, I apply my dot count construction, then I take the coherent nerve. That's quite a complicated thing to do. Um, there is a more, uh, there's a more straightforward way um, written down by Lurie, but still not very straightforward. Someone writes down some formula and he proves that they work. Um, and the formula he writes down looks suspiciously like a Markaton equation. Um, and that was another of our motivations. Um, and so, in fact, one can recover um, the DG nerve as Markaton elements for our bar co bar construction. So um, the DG nerve um, takes a category, DG category D, and we send it to uh, HOM in co algebras to the bar construction um, from the twisted chain co algebra on the co simplicial simplex, the standard co simplicial simplex. Um, so this is really somehow. Uh, a little bit analogous uh, to the um, constructions like in rational homotopy theory. Um, and um, another way of writing this, because of the way the Kobar co co constructions is mediated by Markaton elements, these are Markaton elements um, for this uh, convolution algebra between the Chenko algebra on twisted, on the simplex, uh, on the course of simplex, and the DG category. Um, and we can, uh, I mean, this is a little bit of a, uh, of a shorthand notation, um, but uh, I think I'm not going to uh, spell it out more. Um, and finally, uh, let's go back to topology for uh, the last two minutes. Um, I mean, arguably, I, I would say that somehow this whole, this whole story is very topological. It is somehow, um, I mean, particularly this, this coherent nerve uh, 
structure is somehow, to me, it's very suggestive of looking at infinity, as infinity sets with the Julian model structure as somehow still homotopical uh, objects. Um, that's a monos topology. Um, so uh, this is about homotopy theory of quasi categories of open spaces, but infinity categories naturally pop up when looking at topological objects. And so one example is um, if we have a nice stratified space, um, then one can construct or do we construct the exit path category, which is somehow the subspace of singular synthesis, which respect the stratification so they can leave strata, they can't enter strata. Um, and this exit path category can be used to describe constructible sheaves just as functors out of the exit category. Um, so from the exit category to uh, just the vector spaces. Um, and so that's, uh, so this R given by is a, is a theorem of Lurie's. Um, but now we can unravel our um, the DG nerve um, and our description of the DG nerve. Um, and we can write this down as uh, co modules. So constructible sheaves on a, a nice stratified space are given by the infinity category of co modules over the uh, Chenko algebra of, exit path, uh, of the exit path category. Um, and this is really a generalization of the case of uh, infinity local systems, right, which are very special constructible sheaves. Um, which can be written as co-modules over the chain co-algebra of X. Um, and this is a good moment to stop. Are there any questions? Thank you. So let's give a applause and thank um, Julian. So are there any questions or comments? I, ha I have a, a, a comment. Uh, sure. So maybe let's start with that. Um, so yeah, so uh, that was very nice. Thank you, I like it a lot. So this is a conceptual comment. You started mentioning the base loop space um, mm -hmm. functor, right? So if you have a, a pointed topological space, you can associate a topological monoid through the base loop space functor, uh, considering loops at your base point. So now yeah. in any object case, uh, or in the non-pointed case, you can consider any topological space as an infinity category, essentially, right? Or as a category enriched over topological spaces. So given the topological space, you can define a category whose objects are the points in your space. And then given any two points, yeah. you have a space of maps of paths with the compact open topology, right? So this, this is a passage from spaces to topological categories. Um, and I guess what you're, yeah, what, uh, this, this models that passage, but instead of starting with a space, you now start with a DG coalgebra, right? Curved DG coalgebra. Mm -hmm. um, and then the output is a differential graded category, right? So it's, it's modeling this, this passage. And then uh, my comment is that there's an intermediate passage, which is like given by the coherent nerve functor and the adjunct of that. So instead of starting with a space, now you start with a simplicial set, right? And you want to model this topological category of paths combinatorially, right? Yeah. So the idea is to do something similar to what we learned from the Cobar construction. Now, given any two vertices, I kind of want to describe a simplicial set of paths between those two vertices, right? And how do you do this? Well, you consider what, um, what they're calling the literature necklaces of simplices, which is like monomials of simplices connecting the two vertices, mm -hmm. ordered monomials, such that the first vertex of one agrees with the last vertex of the previous one, right? Yeah. Now you, th these are the monomials in the Cobar construction. But now the, the problem is that you cannot take all monomials because you want them to match, right? And that matching is exactly uh, the cotensor products over, yeah. over the objects, 
right? So there are these three three stories. One is the space level story. Given mm -hmm. any space, you associate a topological category. Then given any simplicial set, you model this combinatorially and associate yeah. a simplicial category. And then below you have given a curved coalgebra. You describe these constructions in a purely algebraic manner that associate a DG category. And then the corresponding diagrams commute. Yeah. And in the one in the one object case, you get uh, Adam's original construction because there you can take all monomials without imposing their restriction. Right. Uh, yes. Two simplices meet at a connecting point because you only have one one object. So that yeah, that was my that that's how I think about it. Yeah. No, that's a, I mean it's a nice story. Um, it... Any other questions or comments? I'm still recording. I can stop. Uh, and we can still have a ask more questions if you prefer not to be recorded. So let me stop the recording.